Howdy and welcome to the 10 Week Bible Study. This is week seven, day two of our study of Esther. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and today we're talking about Esther 7, 5 through 7. Welcome back to the 10 Week Bible Study. Again, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs. Would you join me as we pray before we start today? Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears to hear from your word today? We want to encounter you. We want to meet you in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that, let's jump into God's word. We're reading today from the NIV. This is Esther 7, starting in verse 5. King Xerxes asked Esther, Who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. Right? What Esther has said yesterday in our passage was, Spare me and my people. I've been... It's been announced that I'm to die. Me and my people are all going to be annihilated. That's my request. Spare my life. Now, remember, Haman is sitting there with his eyes huge and his jaw is dropped down. Now he's thinking, no, no, it can't be. You're a Jew. Oh, this is bad. This is really, really, really bad. And so she says it the way she says it. She's drawn this out for two days. And again, I said, I don't know if this was part of the plan. If she chickened out on day one and on day two, she's not. However it worked, all of this has worked together, right? This has all come together because she did day one. In between day one, banquet one and banquet two, Haman's erected the gallows or the pole or whatever it was for Mordecai. The king has had the, the annals of his reign read to him and it was told, you know, Mordecai saved your life. He has Haman parade Mordecai through the town, right? All of this has happened in between banquet one and banquet two, day one and day two. And now all of this is coming together in this one moment. And the king is furious. He says, who is he? Where is he? What man would dare to do such a thing to the queen, my wife? Now, remember, Haman didn't know that she is a Jew. The king, maybe, I think even up to this point, might not have known that she's a Jew. Maybe maybe he did at this point. I don't know. It doesn't make that perfectly clear. We just know that Esther had never told him, and, and it says that she honored what Mordecai said. And so I kind of think even up to this point, it's not come up that Esther is a Jew. Verse 6. Esther said, an adversary, an enemy, this vile Haman. You can, you can see her pointing her finger at Haman. There's only three of them at this banquet. And she sticks her finger right in Haman's nose. And she says, this vile man, he's the one who's decreed this. Again, I think Haman is quickly putting all this together, right? This is a very quick conversation. What is, what is it that you want? And she says, spare me and my people, right? This is happening real fast. And Haman's like, oh no, no, <laughs> right? Continue in verse six. I love this. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine and went out into the palace garden so all of this comes together. Esther points at Haman and says, this vile man, he's an adversary and an enemy. And he's decreed this. The king gets so angry. He doesn't say anything to Esther. He doesn't respond to her. He doesn't look at Haman and say anything. He jumps up and he walks out into the courtyard. And so he's going to go out and do a little thinking. What do I do about this? He's going to go and, and ponder what's to be done. I mean, this is the, he's at the height of his emotions saying, I've given this man the signet ring. I've put him in charge. What have I done? Oh my goodness. And again, I, I don't know this for a fact. The Bible doesn't tell us this, but I think it kind of alludes to this. There's been trouble in his kingdom up to this point. All of the people in chapter one who were there for this six month display of power and splendor and majesty, all of the officials that it lists, they're never listed again. 
And instead, Haman is the guy in charge of everything now. He's basically the steward, the, the, um, uh, I, I can't remember the, the ancient word that they would use, but he's the guy in charge of all of this. And, uh, and, and so the king has got to be thinking, I got rid of those first guys. Again, the Bible didn't say this. This is me supposing this. I think it leads us to believe this. I, I do. I got rid of all of those people that were around me before. And now I've put Haman in charge. It's like, I, I keep making terrible decisions and, and it's getting worse. Now he's trying to kill my wife, right? So I imagine there's a swirl of things going on in the king's mind about what on earth is going on. I personally think, because this is almost certainly, almost definitely the King Xerxes that fought the Battle of Thermopylae. I think that all of that happened in between Esther becoming queen and now. I think, I personally think that's why Haman is in charge instead of the original guys that maybe were in charge of the campaign against the Greeks. All of this kind of stuff, the king is his head spinning now. Everyone's head spinning except for Esther and Mordecai. They're like, we're, we're getting ours. We're getting ours now. This We realize things are, are turning. Esther understands that uh, she has... Things are going her way as soon as she hears about what's done for Mordecai. And now she's got the boldness again. Maybe she chickened out on the first day. And because of what happened to Mordecai that morning, maybe that's why she now has the boldness to say this this way. Again, I don't know. The Bible doesn't make it clear. If you were to ask me my opinion, I think she chickened out on the first day. That's my opinion. Again, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that this could have been part of the plan from the beginning. I think she chickened out. I think the Lord used that moment. Uh, maybe even the Lord nudged her to chicken out so he could set all of the rest of this stuff up. And she gets boldness. I think she gets boldness from finding out what happened to Mordecai earlier in the day. Finding out that there's a gallows or a, a pike or whatever it was. This giant 75 foot tall structure set up for Mordecai. I think she gets boldness in the midst of all of this, realizing what was about to happen, realizing how the Lord turned the tables. In Acts chapter 4, the disciples, all the apostles, they're gathered together, they're getting persecuted, and, and they ask the Lord for boldness. They get persecuted, they go back, and they're praying. Like, they actually get, all of the apostles, they get beaten by the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. And they go back and they, they, they consider themselves worthy of getting taking this beating because Jesus got beat. And, and their request is interesting. They say, give us boldness to preach the gospel by stretching out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders and miracles. Make us bold by doing the stuff that you did in Jesus' ministry on the day of Pentecost. Make us bold to speak out by doing stuff. It wasn't just about the stuff, the, the cool stuff, the miracles, the signs and wonders. They were for the purpose of making them bold. And that's what happens when we see these kinds of things. When the Lord comes through, it makes us bold. We want to say, the Lord did this. When our friends and family are healed of cancer, we want to say, the Lord did this. When we go through financial miracles, we want to say, the Lord did this. And Mordecai gets honored in front of everybody. And Esther all of a sudden realizes, I was put in this position right? We've talked about how Mordecai, Esther, nobody would have chosen this for her. And she's all of a sudden in this one day realizing Mordecai is right. The Lord put me here for this moment. All of these things are coming together for this one speech. These few sentences are the thing that mattered most in Esther's life. God did all of these things for these 45 seconds of Esther's life. And she gets bold. She points her finger at Haman and says, that man, that vile man, he's the one who did this. 
He storms out. Haman's terrified. Let's continue on. Verse 6. Or verse 7. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. So it was very clear to Esther and Haman that he storms out. And he's thinking about not what is he going to do with Haman, but how is he going to do it? And so Haman thinks that maybe he can find mercy with Esther. <laughs> Esther and Mordecai have probably gone back a little bit at this point, And Esther's thinking, you're not going to show us mercy. You had no intention of showing us mercy. You built a gallows to hang essentially my adopted father or Pike, whatever you built this thing to kill Mordecai and you're going to beg me for mercy. No, she's not even going to get the chance to answer while the King's out. Maybe he's blubbering and begging her, but she's not really going to get the chance to answer. She's not going to, even if she had wanted to, she's not going to get the opportunity to beg the king to spare Haman. I doubt she would have. I'm 100% sure that she wouldn't have. But it's not going to matter. Because we're going to see that Haman is just making things worse for himself really fast. And we'll get into that tomorrow. For the 10-Week Bible Study, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and I can't wait to see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching the 10-Week Bible Study. If you've enjoyed this, would you consider doing that whole like and subscribe and bell thing you're always hearing people talk about? It really helps other people find out about the show, and my heart is for people to fall in love with God's Word. Thank you. <laughs>